Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this slideshow is going to cover experimental design, or how, how experiments are put together to scientifically demonstrate that a cause is actually producing an effect. The best place to start when designing an experiment is identify a clear-cut problem, and we're going to go back into history here and look at a problem that a lot of people are fighting with today. This idea of cigarette smoking, I mean, is it really dangerous? Historically, people have been burning tobacco for about 2,000 years to inhale the smoke, and um, I believe um, North American, South American, Central American Indians taught Westerners, Europeans, how to do it, and the rest is history. I'll refer you to your history teachers for that. But for a long time, um, advertisers uh, supported an industry that was selling a product, and of course they did experiments to prove that tobacco was a good thing, and the ads I think speak for themselves here. Um, lots of health benefits were attributed to cigarette smoke. Uh, today the ads are completely different, because I think over the last um, 100 years, uh, the evidence against breathing smoke into your lungs has um, completely outweighed any benefit it might actually provide. So, let's design an experiment around this, this problem of, of cigarette smoke. So, first thing we need to do is, di is develop a hypothesis, which is a statement that makes a prediction. So, we've got to look at this problem of smoking, and we've got to find a variable that we really want to test. And as you can see from this list, there are lots of variables that need to be controlled. Um, highlight them here in blue for you. We're going to go with the simplest one, just the exposure to cigarette smoke. So let's take that one and work with it. We're going to make cigarette smoke our independent variable. We're going to pick it and make it the variable that we're testing or that we're controlling. And we're going to measure a dependent variable, which is going to be illness. And we're going to keep all the other variables constant. So tobacco smoke is going to be our independent variable, something we can control. We can pick people or set up situations where the amount of cigarette smoke you're exposed to is controlled. And then we're going to count or we're going to measure how many of those people get sick. And we're going to keep all the other variables constant. We're not going to let them change. Got it? All right. Okay. To set up an experimental situation, we've got to decide on our groups or some, some people call them levels. And the most important experimental group is going to be the control group. And for us, that's going to be the group of people that are not exposed to the independent variable, which in this case is cigarette smoke. And then we're going to set up our experimental groups. And just for fun, we're going to set up three of them. We're going to do level one, which is going to be made up of adult males that are smoking a pack or less a day. Level two, which is going to be made up of the same number of adult males who are smoking more than a pack a day. And the third level is going to be a group of adult males who are exposed to secondhand smoke in some way. So we have three levels that are dealing with our independent variable, the exposure to smoke, and we have a control group where to compare them to where people are where these, these adult males are not going to be exposed to cigarette smoke. And keep in mind here, we are keeping things constant. We are moving with the same number, we're the same sex of people, the same age of people, and we are keeping these constants the same between all of our experimental groups. All right, we're going to write a hypothesis now. Um, we're going to say that the cigarette smoke a person exposed to, the more, the more cigarette smoke a person is exposed to, the more likely they are to get sick. So if they smoke, then they're going to get sick. So we got a problem here. What exactly does sick mean? Just not feeling well or catching a disease of some sort? So in order to measure it, we've got to have a, a better definition than just sick. So let's make this DV measurable by assigning it just cancer. So if the person smokes cigarettes and gets any type of cancer, lung cancer, mouth cancer, throat cancer, any of the cancers associated with tobacco, then we're going to count that as a yes. And all the other ones we're going to count as no. All right, so we've identified an IV, which we can control, uh, cigarette smoke exposure, and a DV that we can actually count, which means getting cancer. All right, so let's refine our hypothesis here. So we're going to say now that our hypothesis is the more cigarette smoke a person is exposed to, the more likely they are to get cancer. And remember, cigarette smoke is our IV, and getting cancer is our DV. And if you write a good hypothesis, the IV is always going to be the implied if, and the DV is always going to be the implied then. 
all right? So if you smoke cigarettes, then you're more likely to get cancer, all right? All right, next thing we're going to do is collect data. And we're going to go through medical records, and we're going to find 400 people who meet the criteria of the experiment, which means they're adult males. And we're also going to find 100 adult males that have never been exposed to cigarette smoke. And for each of our levels, for a total of 400 people, we're going to identify 400 people that fit into either our control group or one of our three experimental groups. All right. Here's some data. Now, I'm going to warn you, I just made this up for the sake of this slideshow. I'm not implying or, or saying that this data is in any way scientifically valid. So, enough said there. So, for our control group, we got 96 people out of 100 remained healthy, and 4 got cancer. In our level 1, remember, which was a pack or less, 90 stayed healthy, and 10 got cancer. For our level 2, which was two pet, was what people who smoked at least or more than a pack of cigarettes a day, 85 were healthy and 15 got cancer. Uh, looks like that's the highest number here. And our level three, which was a secondhand smoke one, only 95, or excuse me, 95 remained healthy and only five got cancer. Uh, notice how close these two are, all right? So there's our data. And the best way to evaluate data is to make a graph. It's okay, so graphs need a title. So we're going to say our graph is the effect of cigarette smoke on lung cancer. And remember, graphs are a good way to visually analyze uh, data and look for trends. Um, our DV is the number of people. Our IV, our independent variable, remember, are experimental groups. And here I've put our data into a very simple bar chart. Blue is healthy and green is cancer or not healthy. And you can see immediately here that our level two, as we saw in our data table, if you look at the level two data here, this group of people, level two seems to get more cancer than anybody else. So it looks like our hypothesis is working. All right, we're gonna evaluate our data again. Here's our graph. And I think we've already decided that because level two was so high, was the highest, that we're going to say that there is a connection between cigarette smoke and getting cancer. So in science, we accept the hypothesis. Okay, We don't say that the hypothesis is true or that it's right. We just say that we accept it based on the data that we are lo we're looking at. All right, now we got to write a conclusion. Uh, remember, your conclusion is going to be the part of your experiment that you're communicating to people. It's what they're going to be reading and either agreeing or disagreeing with you. For a good hypothesis, you want to restate your hypothesis. You want to summarize your data using as specific a set of numbers as you can. You're going to then have a statement saying whether you accepted or rejected your hypothesis. You're going to talk about your experimental design and admit to mistakes that you identified after you started your experiment, which we're going to call sources of error. And you may even identify some variables you didn't even know about that needed to be controlled. For example, how long did these people smoke cigarettes? Uh, we didn't identify that variable when we set up our experiment earlier. And finally, you're going to su suggest improvements for future experimentation, experiments that you're going to do or that your assistants or people following you are going to be doing. Now, the big problem with experiments is everybody wants their experiment to work. And sometimes, because an experimenter wants their data to support their hypothesis, they can either intentionally or unintentionally skew their data, which means fudge it to make it work. There's always a danger that the experimental designer is going to accidentally, or on purpose, fudge their data to prove their hypothesis. So you always got to be on the lookout for that. And in, the, in our experiment here, the scientist, as you go through the medical records, can't know in advance if these people got cancer or not. All that you can know while you're going through the medical records to find your 400 adult males is how much they were exposed to cigarette smoke. You can't know whether or not they get sick while you're doing that. Because if you did, then you have no way to control for this experiment or bias. Um, bias is something that is identified in lots of experiments, uh, published works, and this is one of the things where make that collaboration comes into play. Uh, collaboration is very important to identify just how valid an experiment is in proving or, in, excuse me, in accepting or rejecting the hypothesis. All right, so that's an example using tobacco smoke of setting up a simple experiment. Thank you very much, and I hope this helps you understand how scientists design experiments.